Today is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. <coughs> the epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 6. Brethren, all you who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death. For we are buried together with him by baptism into death. That is, Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, and that we may serve sin no longer. For he that is dead is justified from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ. Knowing that Christ, rising again from the dead, dies now no more, death shall no more have dominion over him. For in that he died to sin, he died once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. <laughs> Taken from St. Mark chapter 8. At that time when there was a great multitude of Jesus, and they had nothing to eat, calling his disciples together, he said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, but behold, they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I shall send them away fasting to their home, they will faint on the way, for some of them came from afar off. And his disciples answered him, From whence can anyone fill these here? with bread in the wilderness. And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? Who said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And taking the seven loaves, giving thanks, he broke and gave to the disciples to set before the people. And they had a few fish, and he blessed them, and commanded them to be set before them. And they did eat and were filled, and they took up that which was left over of the fragments, seven baskets, and they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. By way of announcement, and for all these intentions, we'll pray listed here for the dead, the deceased, the sick, and so forth, and for the Pope, we'll say the Our Father of Mary. faith 
Father Ring Rose does not have the halos in there yet, but hopefully someday when uh, the, the Blessed Mother restores sanity to the Pope's mind, it brings him back to the Catholic faith and restores Catholic tradition to the Church. And uh, this, of course, will be done, she said it would be, when the Pope finally consecrates Russia to the back of Mary. For all the speak, for all the talk of disobedience and being you know, disrespectful, uh, let's face it, uh, with all respect, the Popes of Vatican II have disobeyed the Mother of God continually. They have not consecrated Russia to the Magna Carta Mary. And so the world and the Church just continue to be delivered to the diabolical disorientation that Sister Lucia was told by the Virgin Mary would happen to the authorities. A, a, a blinding of the authorities and a loss of the faith. And this has been the greatest, the greatest disaster for the Catholic Church and for society as well, because society is plunging. And you know as well, you know this in the past week, the United States Supreme Court just caved in on an unspeakable crime that will call down fire from heaven as it did for Sodom and Gomorrah. So this, this church has this wonderful stained glass window. Someday hopefully those, those uh, halos will be filled in. So today, 25 years ago uh, happened one of the greatest events of the 20th century. I had the happiness to be there as a young seminarian. It was truly an impressive day. It was packed <clears throat> with a huge tent, packed with over 10,000 people from all over Europe, from all over the world. Many, many priests, monks, nuns, and the Archbishop uh, <clears throat> came in on the procession, blessing everybody, smiling. He was very relieved on that day because he had been dealing with these modernists in Rome. He had hoped something could be worked out with cardinals in Rome who still knew tradition under Pius XII. He was hoping for something, but every time he, uh, something, a, a deal could be done, he saw there was a trap laid to accept the conciliar church, to accept the new mass and Vatican II. And the Archbishop saw clearly, we cannot cave in on these things or we will step into the trap and will be de de devoured by the wolves. So thank God that he has raised up in our time a great saint, Archbishop Lefebvre. I call him a saint. And uh, I say that not lightly, because he truly lived a holy life, and he truly put God first, and he, he would be willing to die for the faith. And he did die a death that maybe is more painful than a physical death, which is to have your reputation, uh, you know, excommunicated, disobedient, uh, dissident. <clears throat> so I would like to draw from the very sermon he gave 25 years ago, because not much more needs to be said. It's very beautiful. And you see, the Archbishop was a bishop. A bishop has a duty to feed the flock, to feed the sheep. How does he feed them? As our Lord did today in the Gospel, he fed those that were hungry. And our Lord himself said, if you ask your father for bread, what kind of father will give you a rock? If you ask your father for uh, a fish, a fish burger, what father will give you instead a snake? If you ask for an egg, what, what kind of father will give you a scorpion? And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre said in one of his sermons, all we want is the Pope to be Pope. The Pope to be Pope, to do his duty, to feed the sheep. Instead of giving us snakes of Vatican II poison and scorpions of the new mass that make souls lose their faith and rocks, rocks of charismatic nonsense, Vatican II wish wash, give the true bread of the true doctrine. That is the duty of the Pope. 
And the Archbishop, and that's the duty of the bishops now, of the four of them consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre, their duty today now is to tell the Pope, you are feeding us rocks, scorpions, and snakes. Give us the faith. We pray for you. We respect your authority as Vicar of Christ. Please stop destroying the sheep that our Lord died for. And so you see the, the love of the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ in the heart of Bishop Lefebvre, Archbishop Lefebvre. And uh, this is the crisis now in our dear society in Pius X. Of course, most of you don't think you need to worry too much about this because you have a very faithful priest here. He's been here and God has given him good health and hopefully many, many more years. But the rest of the world depends on the SSPX, the society. And it's, it's a very sad crisis now. I know Father Ringrose has spoken about it, but uh, it's unbelievable that we can see a time when the, the bishop who's leading the society of Pius X is now shaking hands with the modernists, now speaking about making an agreement, and more worse than all of that, has already swallowed the poison of Vatican II with the doctrinal declaration that was sent last April. This declaration swallows the poison. That's saying that the Vatican II is not so bad, it's, it enlightens and deepens Catholic tradition. If it's seen in the light of tradition, it's, it's okay. And uh, the errors of Vatican II are difficulties, sorry, they're not difficulties, they are errors and heresies condemned by the previous popes. And in that document, he also officially accepts the new mass as legitimately promulgated, which is the same as saying it's legitimate, which is one step from saying it, and accepts totally the new code. How does this happen? It's unbelievable, this, this, this disaster. So once the poison has entered from the top, once the poison has entered the mouth, it's into the bloodstream. It's in the bloodstream. The liberalism is in the bloodstream of our dear society. And that's why we, the, the few priests throughout the world, a handful, <clears throat> are resisting this. Because it's a danger to the faith. So, so this sermon could be given today of Archbishop Lefebvre. So I want to just quote parts from it for you. So this ceremony, he says, is to manifest our attachment to Rome, that we are performing this ceremony. It is not in order to manifest our, it is in order to manifest our attachment to the eternal Rome, not the conciliar Rome, the eternal Rome, to the Pope and to all those who have pre preceded these last Popes who unfortunately, since the Vatican Council II, have thought it their duty to adhere to grievous errors which are demolishing the church and the Catholic priesthood. So here he sets the, the tone. In the sermon he also uh, mentions about the bishops to be ordained, you can kiss their ring instead of their hands. He speaks about the flyers and, and pamphlets that were available for everybody after to explain why we're not excommunicated, why Rome will do the excommunications, but it's water off a duck's back. So he goes on to say, this is a very important paragraph here, this is why we do this ceremony. ceremony. Far be it from me to set myself up as a pope. I am simply a bishop of the Catholic Church who is continuing to, to transmit Catholic doctrine I think, and this will certainly not be too far off, that you will be able to engrave on my tombstone these words of St. Paul, Tradidi Quodet Acebi, which means, I have handed down to you what I have received. This is the duty of every pope, bishop, and priest. Not to invent, not to compromise, not to change the faith, transmit it, hand it down, because the faith doesn't come from our our heart or our opinion. The faith comes from God. It is revealed through the sacred scripture and tradition. All the public revelations ceased with the death of St. John. And that 
deposit of the faith is to be handed down. And that is the, the Catholic faith. That's the beauty of the Catholic faith. It's, it's, it's beautiful in itself. We just have to believe and submit. I continue. I am just the postman bringing you a letter. I did not write the letter, this message, this word of God. God himself wrote it. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself gave it to us. As for us, we, we just hand it down through these dear priests here present and through all those who have chosen to resist this wave of apostasy in the church. And now we have a, this wave of apostasy now affecting our dear society in Pius X. And we have to resist. We have to resist. By keeping the eternal faith and giving it to the faithful, we are just carriers of this good news, of this gospel which our Lord Jesus Christ gave to us, as well as the, as the means of sanctification, the Holy Mass, the true Holy Mass, the true sacraments which, which truly give the spiritual life. So now the Archbishop, uh, this is a very, he goes on to say, it seems to me, my dear brethren, that I am hearing the voices of all these popes, and he lists them. Since Gregory the Sixteenth, Pius the Ninth, Leo the Thirteenth, Saint Pius the Tenth, Benedict the Fifteenth, Pius the Eleventh, Pius the Twelfth, telling us, "Please, we beseech you, what are you going to do with our teaching, with our preaching, with the Catholic faith? Are you going to abandon it? Are you going to let it disappear from this earth?" So the Archbishop speaking his own mind, saying how he stands before God. If he doesn't do this, it would be a mortal sin if he did not consecrate the bishops. Are you going to let it disappear from the earth? Please, please, these popes are telling him, continue to keep this treasure which we have given you. Do not abandon the faithful. Do not abandon the church. Continue the church. Indeed, since the council, what we condemned in the past, the present Roman authority, authorities have embraced and are professing. How is it possible? We have condemned them. Liberalism, communism, socialism, modernism, Sionism. All the errors which we have condemned are now professed, adopted and supported by the authorities of the church. So how is it possible for Bishop Fillet, with all respect to Bishop Fillet as Superior General, how is it possible he can say that the document on religious liberty, the document on uh, the relationship with non-Catholic religions can be uh, workable with discussion and with some difficulties? There is no discussion, there is no working out with heresy and condemned errors by all the previous popes. It's very serious what is the cancer that is now affecting Catholic tradition now. And I go on with the Archbishop. Is it possible, unless you do something to continue this tradition of the Church which we have given to you, all of it shall disappear, souls will be lost. So you see, the heart of Archbishop Lefebvre is, is a true heart of our Lord. Look after the souls. And he speaks about the Adjournamento at Vatican II, and then he goes to the May 5th Protocol, 1988. Now, now many of the uh, priests of the Society of Vatican now are saying, well, that protocol that Archbishop of Feb signed on May 5th was fine. He was happy with it. He just wasn't happy because he didn't get the bishop or a date for a bishop to consecrate. So they're saying that, well, you know, the Archbishop really wanted the agreement, but the only obstacle to the agreement was he wasn't given the bishops and the date. But that is not the full truth. And, and, and they're also saying that this, this whole question of the agreement with Rome is only a question of prudence and practical measures. And if we can just set up our, get recognized, and stay as we are, we'll convert the church from within. And you know what Archbishop Lefebvre said about that? He said that's a total illusion. 
He said we would be approved, we would be under the authorities of these modernists, and they, we would be swamped, he said. All the work of tradition would have come to nothing. And you want the proof? Look at all the, all the traditional communities who have made agreements with Rome. Every one of them have fallen to compromise. Eleven years ago, Campos made the agreement with Rome. They are silent ever since against the errors. They don't preach anymore against the errors of Vatican II and the New Mass. And farther, they now say the new mass, some of those priests giving communion in the hand with altar girls. So we don't think we can fall. St. Paul says, woe to you if you think you stand, because you fall. And uh, look at St. Peter's, of course, except the new mass, they can't preach against it. Look at the poor redemptorists who fell with the agreement with Rome, now they're under the local diocesan bishop, he's no friend of tradition. It's common sense. And the great principle of common sense that Archbishop always repeats throughout all this is it's not the children who tell mom and dad what to do and form the parents. It's the parents who form the children. It's not the athletes who form the coach. It's the coaches who form the, the team and train them and discipline them. <coughs> so it's not the inferiors who form the superiors. It's the superiors who form the inferiors. So if you go put yourself under modernist superiors who are against tradition, of course they're going to crush. They're going to destroy Catholic tradition. And see, the Archbishop knew this, and, he, he, and that's why he did the consecrations. But listen to his own words. So people ask, <clears throat> this is why we are convinced that by the act of these consecrations today, 25 years ago, we are obeying the call of these great popes, and as a consequence, the call of God, since they represent our Lord Jesus Christ in the church. And so some people ask, so why, Archbishop, have you stopped these discussions which seem to have a certain degree of success? He almost made the agreement. He signed the protocol, and the next day he recanted. And it was very clear to the world that he recanted. Well, precisely because at the same time that I gave my signature to the protocol on May 5th, 1988, the envoy of Cardinal Ratzinger gave me a note in which I was asked to beg pardon for my errors. But if I am in error, if I teach error, it is clear that I must be brought back to the truth in the minds of those who sent me this note to sign. That I might recognize my errors means that if you recognize your errors, we will help you return to the truth. What is this truth for them, if not the truth of Vatican II, the truth of the conciliar church? Consequently, it is clear that the only truth that exists today for the Vatican is the conciliar truth. The spirit of the council, the spirit of Assisi, that is the truth of today, but we will have nothing to do with this for anything in the world. And when he said that, there was a gigantic applause throughout the whole tent. Because the people were so grateful, a bishop stood up to keep the faith. But all of the other ones just caved in. Caved in. So, I ask you, have things changed with Rome today? Has Rome become more, more traditional? Benedict XVI or Pope Francis? Have they come back to tradition in any way? No way. And if they make any steps that seem to be towards tradition, it's always, uh, it's always wrapped in this conciliar, the errors of Vatican II. So nothing has changed. It's worse than 1988. And yet, many society priests now are saying, sadly, and I don't know how, because well, it comes from the mouth of the, the Bishop Follet, that Rome has changed. It's more traditional. They lifted the Latin mass abrogation, the, the, the excommunications, whatever words, <coughs> excommunications were lifted. And so these are signs. And that's not true. As Archbishop Lefebvre said, these are maneuvers 
maneuvers and tactics to bring you back to the conciliar church. And why did Archbishop of not go through? Because the faith was put in danger. The faith, the faith, the faith, the doctrine, the doctrine, the doctrine. If you compromise on the doctrine, you're done. And just to show you, I mean, an airplane pilot, if he just turns his wheel five degrees to the left, he is going to end up thousands of miles from where he was supposed to land. If you change and play with the principles of the Catholic faith, you, you're, you go way off. So, the Archbishop, I'm not going to read the whole sermon, obviously, but he says also here, That is why I sent a letter to the Pope saying to him very clearly, we simply cannot accept the spirit and proposals, despite all the desires which we have to be in full union with you. Given this new spirit which now rules in Rome and which you wish to communicate to us, we prefer to continue in tradition, to keep tradition while waiting for tradition to regain its place at Rome, while waiting for tradition to reassume its place in the Roman authorities in their minds. This will last for as long as the good Lord has foreseen. It doesn't look like it's going to be too soon because we have a Pope who is truly modernist, who told the United Nations, the Holy See and the United Nations share the same goals for humanity, who told the Protestant uh, Lutheran president, whatever he is, that in 2017, the, the Vatican will celebrate the Protestant Reformation is this a sign of Rome coming back to tradition? Far from it. It is not for me, the Archbishop said, not for me to know when tradition will regain its, right, its, its rights in Rome, but I think it is my duty to provide the means of doing that which I shall call Operation Survival. Operation Survival for tradition. Today, this day, is Operation Survival. If I had made this deal with Rome by continuing with the agreements we had signed and by putting them into practice, I would have performed Operation Suicide. There was no choice. We must live. That is why today, by consecrating this bishop, I am convinced that I am continuing to keep tradition alive, that is to say, the Catholic Church. When he said these words again, there was an enormous applause. The people were so grateful. And so he went on to say about Bishop de Castelmer, and he also went on to say how the Virgin Mary foretold this apostasy within the Catholic Church. Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of La Salette, and he referred also to Our Lady of Quito. And in Quito, the Virgin Mary in Ecuador, she appeared and she, he, she he, he, I'll read his own words. I excuse myself from continuing this account of the apparition, but she, the Virgin Mary speaks of a prelate who will absolutely oppose this wave of apostasy and impiety, saving the priesthood by forming good priests. And again, there was an enormous applause because he excused himself, but uh, it's obvious what bishop last century, opposed the apostasy, who stood up to the Pope, to all the bishops who caved into modernism, who's the only bishop, well, actually two of them, that stood up against the apostasy. And it was, of course, our Bishop of Feb, but he, but he referred to Quito, and he had just heard about it. He didn't know about it before. So the Virgin Mary, way back in the 1611, foretold Archbishop of Feb. His role. So, dear, dear faithful, the battle goes on. Don't get comfortable. Don't get uh, forgetful. You have a solid priest. Thank God. By the ring roses, it's a great, great priest. And thank God for this country. It's a grace for this country. But our dear Society of Isaac Tenth is being poisoned with the very things that the Archbishop uh, opposed. 
And I repeat, once you swallow Vatican II in any form, once you swallow and accept it, which the society officially did in that declaration, once you put no longer doctrine first, but just let's go along to get along, let's just agree, which, which happened in the six conditions of the general chapter statement of July 14th last year. And once you accept the new mass as legitimate, legitimately promulgated, same thing, you're done. The poison's in, the head's chopped off. The, 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 the wings of the plane are blown off. There's only one direction. And the proof is given to us over and over. All those traditional groups who have compromised with Rome. The only difference is we've swallowed, the SSBX has swallowed the poison without the, as far as we know publicly, the written agreement. All the other groups first made the agreement, then they went silent, swallowed the poison, and caved in on the new mass of Vatican II. And this is a disaster. It's very, very sad what has happened. So I beg you to pray for, pray for a long life of Father Ringrose <laughs> to take care of you. Pray for uh, our dear Society St. Pius X. Pray for all the priests, 530 to 60 priests. Pray for them. And you know how the devil is raging mad. Here we are 25 years after, and we're watching Vatican II happen again in our own priestly society. So this is not a time to sit back and twiddle your thumbs. This is a time of war. And all of you have a part to play in this battle. If you're old and retired, don't think it's just time to rest and vac vacate. You have, to, you have a duty to offer your sufferings, your loneliness, your rosaries, your communion, your penances for souls, for the church. And all of you, in some ways, all of your states of life, all of you, God has given you your own states of life, whether it be married, whether you be children, whether it be men, women, you all have a role to play. You all have something to, to offer to God. So pray, keep the daily rosary, be informed, pray for all the priests, I beg you. Pray for this Pope to consecrate Russia. That's the only solution from heaven. And on this great day, uh, again, uh, let us thank God in this Holy Mass for giving us these two pillars, the Archbishop of Fed and Bishop de Castamere, in this age of confusion. At least they held up high the light of the true Catholic faith and tradition. Let's pray to the Mother of God never to compromise, never to waver, but to be faithful so that we can die in the Catholic faith and tradition and come to see the glory and the beauty of the Blessed Trinity which happiness I wish you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.
Domnus, Obisco, Oremus, 